Aloha nui loa. My name is Jan Ulrich, and I will be presenting about a pedagogical grammar on Lakota. Uh, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Hawaiian people on whose ancestral lands uh, this conference is hosted, and also extend my respect to any Indigenous viewers watching this presentation. This project was conducted in partnership between the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe and the Lakota Language Consortium, and it was funded by the ANA and the North Dakota Council of Humanities. Uh, the Lakota language is a highly endangered language of the Sioux and language family. The community is located primarily on five reservations in South and North Dakota, as well as in numerous urban communities across the country. The full title of the grammar book is as follows, Lakota Grammar Handbook, a pedagogically oriented self-study reference and practice book for beginner to upper intermediate students. Here I list some of its main features. It has over 600 pages divided. It is divided into 233 units. It has uh, more than 7,000 example sentences and 11,600 sentences in practice activities. It is a corpus-driven grammar with extensive, extensive appendices and answer key for practice activities, three indexes, and it is the most comprehensive grammar of the language to date. Let me begin by discussing why I have a pedagogical grammar. Formal uh, grammars are obviously an important aspect of describing indigenous languages. However, it's been widely recognized and acknowledged that formal research and formal reference grammars are generally not accessible to people in these speech communities. Rice uh, discussed what she terms as empowerment or empowering research, which uh, is research on the language, but specifically for and with the people of the community. And so the development of the pedagogical grammar of Lakota is very much in line with this notion. Uh, the aim of this project was to create a reference tool that is accessible to community members and created with the involvement of native speakers. Their role in the development was key and it was multifold as this presentation will show. Between 1992 and 2016, I worked with over 400 native speakers who recorded stories and dialogues, which allowed us to significantly extend the exist existing text corpus on Lakota. I have been gradually transcribing these stories, which is still an uh, ongoing process because it's a, as anybody who's been doing transcription knows, it's very time consuming to do so. And I use uh, standard corpus linguistics methods to analyze the texts. <clears throat> During this process, uh, many native speakers were consulted on the transcription and interpretation of the various grammatical patterns found in the texts. Ben Blackbear Jr., who is in the middle of this picture, was the chief consultant involved with the, the entire project during its entire time. And he and Iris Eagle Chasing, also in the picture, um, also created, created a studio recording of all of the sentences in the book. And these recordings are now used in the interactive version of the grammar within the Walks Up app. Uh, now let me mention a few things about the corpus-driven approach to writing this grammar and some of the reasons uh, for that. Um, I have long been a proponent of corpus linguistics, and uh, among the reasons why this is so is that I was influenced by the Sinclairian School of Corpus Linguistics early on in my career, but uh, also at the very beginning of my work with the Lakota language, I came to the conclusion based uh, mainly on my empirical observations that data obtained through translational elicitation is problematic more often than not. And the importance of connected speech in the research of indigenous languages is increasingly recognized in the recent years. Uh, and most importantly, in a corpus driven research, it is the authentic discourse by native speakers, which determines the grammatical features that will be included in a grammar book. Hence, it is not the linguist who makes that decision. Uh, another advantage of a corpus driven approach is that it allows for a much more comprehensive coverage of uh, the grammar than elicitation based research. 
And so, for example, in the Lakota grammar, there have there is a number of grammatical patterns that were previously not described in the in the literature on Lakota. And here are some examples, and also examples of patterns that have that were significantly revised or extended in this book. Variation in language is one of the main issues that a grammarian has to face and deal with. Some of the types of variation that we dealt with uh, are variations between formal Lakota and informal Lakota, variations uh, between older Lakota and contemporary Lakota emanating from natural language change, uh, variation resulting from language attrition, variation caused by English influence, and dialectal variations. So to describe or to prescribe, pedagogical grammars usually teach people how the language should be spoken, which is by definition prescriptive. However, this grammar attempts to be descriptive insofar as that it does not exclude any of the documented variants of the grammatical structures. But it also shows a degree of prescriptivism because it points out which variants are more common or more formal, and at times it promotes one variant uh, as a standard. This is in order for the grammar to serve the purposes of codification. Uh, the decision making on which variants uh, should be promoted was done by a committee of native speakers. During the project, a group of 14 native speakers representing each Lakota language, uh, Lakota uh, reservation worked as a codification committee. This took place between 2014 and 15 during the summer Lakota Summer Institute, facilitated in partnership between uh, or among the Sitting Bull College, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, and the Lakota Language Consortium. I prepared data representing the variations and made my observations uh, and also recommendations in some cases. The native speakers then selected the variation to be used uh, as the codified standard and recommend uh, that would be recommended for teaching at schools. Uh, here is the acknowledgement of the uh, elders involved and it is with sadness in my heart to say that many of them unfortunately passed away during the uh, recent six months uh, because of the COVID-19 pan pandemic. Uh, now let me briefly talk about the structure and layout of the book. A, each of the 233 units has two pages. The left-hand page is divided into sections, which gradually introduce the grammatical patterns. Uh, the right-hand page provides exercises that allowed practicing these introduced patterns. This format was firstly introduced by Raymond Murphy in his Essential Grammar in Use, published in, by Cambridge, Cambridge in 1990, that it is a pedagogical grammar of English, obviously, and I used that book myself when I was learning English, and so I was also inspired by it later on when, started, when I started working on this uh, Lakota grammar. Uh, that format has uh, also been very popular uh, and adopted by very many publishing houses working with commonly taught languages. Uh, the grammar is sequenced uh, from simpler to complex. The table of contents uh, here demonstrates that units are organized into groups. And the grouping uh, is usually based on structural properties, but in some cases also on functional criteria. Here is an example. Conditional clauses, for example, share important structural similarities, but also, also cleft sentences, relative clauses, complement clauses are uh, grouped together because they have important structural similarities. Uh, but if you notice down here, a group of units on how to express to be in Lakota is based primarily on functional criteria. Before I can speak more about the pedagogical design of the book, I would like to make a few uh, comments about the role of grammar in second language acquisition. Uh, the role of grammar instruction in second language acquisition has been a hotly debated topic, which triggered fundamental disagreements in the field. The opposing views are represented by the following two approaches. The synthetic uh, approaches, with explicit grammar instruction primarily, for example, grammar translation, audiolingual method, and other methodological approaches, 
And on the other hand, the analytic, analytical approaches with implicit instruction represented primarily by Krashen and his natural approach by immersion schools and uh, so forth. I agree with those authors who state that both of these viewpoints have serious problems and that there is a need for a middle ground solution such as Mike Long's task-based language teaching and other content-based approaches with some level and some type of focus on form. So um, a grammar book is by definition a material with explicit grammar instruction. So tying into the previous slide, uh, you know, how does that, my statement that I think there is a there is a need for a middle ground solution. How does that tie into the explicit uh, grammar instruction in the grammar book? For that, I would like to say the following: the grammar is not intended as a course book, with the exception of of grammar courses which we, for example, offer at the summer institute, but not for a regular communicative uh, type of course book. It is meant to be used primarily as a resource reference material and practice book. As such, it is designed uh, namely for the following groups, Lakota language teachers, curriculum developers, and self-motivated learners who want to increase their grammar awareness and accuracy. So now I can talk uh, more about the pedagogical design. And in this book, the pedagogical design represents an attempt to make grammar information less explicit especially through the following means. Structured data with con con concordance style formatting, input enhancement, input flooding, showing contrasts via, min via minimal pairs, guided induction with noticing questions and sequencing. And uh, of course, it should be emphasized that the goal of a book like this is not to in encourage memorization of grammar rules. Instead, the aim is to help students notice patterns and infer their structural and semantic properties. Another objective is to help students develop inductive skills. Uh, an example of enhanced input for guided induction comes from Unit 60, which introduces the reason clause and the words that express because. So reading the, in the instruction in section uh, A, we use the postposition N to express the reason for something. It translates with for that reason or because, study the examples and note the order of the clauses. So observe the enhanced input, uh, especially through the concordance uh, style layout and also the color coding for highlighting the newly introduced function words for because. Um, and uh, most importantly, the arrows that uh, allow the learner to observe that the order of the two clauses is reverse when comparing a Lakota and English. And also the fact that they can see that there are two clauses in this construction. Uh, so we don't need to use any technical language here, such as subordination or other things, because really the only challenge in learning this grammatical pattern is the order of the clauses. Uh, Lakota is a consistently headmarking language, and as a consequence, all noun phrases are syntactically optional, and we don't have to say it in, in this uh, formal way, and instead we can use, uh, we, don't, we don't need to use this technical description that I just did, but we can provide the following instruction and contextualization. Notice what happens when the words representing the subject and objects are omitted from a sentence with a first dative verb. So the woman opened the door for the man, contextualized with the illustration, and the Lakota sentence, the students can notice that the noun phrases can be dropped, any of them can be dropped, and that the verb alone can constitute the full clause, in which case it will translate with, she opened it for him. As the example above shows, the subject and the two objects are embedded in the dative verb kiyura, and they are still understood when the two were, when the words representing them are omitted. So this is another way of showing them uh, things, such things as zero affixes and the optionality of noun phrases uh, and so forth without using technical language and more through contextualization, scaffolding and enhanced input. Additionally, we also commonly use 
uh, additional notes and comments such as this. Note that we cannot use dative verbs to say things like, I bought it for us or I opened it for us for a discussion see page 520. So this is cross-reference. There are many cross-references of this type that point to the appendix section, which is very extensive. And here, uh, I just want to give you a quick peek at one of the many appendix sections divided according to units and uh, sections within units. And here we offer additional examples of various advanced details, but also references to other formal studies that describe the grammatical pattern. Uh, discussed, and we also uh, point out our revisions of previous research. Uh, here is another example of enhanced input, uh, scaffolding, contextualization, and noticing questions. So here, students are encouraged to observe that in this, in this introduction, observe that the man in the red shirt took a horse from the man in the blue shirt and gave it to the woman that he loves. And the questions uh, are as follows. Does the man in the blue shirt welcome what he, what was done by the man in the red shirt? Does the woman welcome the action of the man in the red shirt? Do they use a different form of the verb ichu or the same form? Shunka wakanki imakichu says the man, and as you can see, the woman says the very same sentence, but crucially, the, the two sentences are, are translated into English in two different ways. He took the horse from me. He took the horse for me. So this allows the learner to observe that uh, malefaction and benefaction are coded contextually in Lakota. Uh, they're coded through the dative verb, obviously, but their semantic interpretation is context-driven, which is also explained here in the information box. Another example uh, is a minimal pair introducing the difference between the first dative and the second dative. So uh, now that you have learned about the first dative and the second dative, it is time to compare them, study the uh, images and the sentences that, that describe them. The first situation is described with the first dative and the second one with the second dative. How are they different? So here the hope is that they will observe uh, that in both sentences, the woman is the subject, the man is the primary object, and the door is the secondary object. The man is the person affected by the action, but in each sentence, he is affected in a different way. Here, he's knocking on the door because he wants to visit with her or talk to her. She opens the door for him. Here, he cannot open the door for himself because he's carrying a heavy object, so she opens the door in his stead, on his behalf. In English, we can say she opened the door for him in both cases, but in Lakota we can make, uh, and we often do make this type of distinction. Another example of teaching through minimal pairs is uh, with the introduction of the verb, of the word cash. We can use cash, but to join two sentences. It too expresses a contrast between two ideas, but unlike keash and tka, those are words introduced in the previous sections. We use it with uh, repeated events. So here, if they study uh, a minimal pair, uh, they will observe that eash is used with a single event, whereas cash is used with repeated or habitual events. Another uh, contrastive example is here. Uh, the contrast between unverified conditional and predictive conditional is very salient in Lakota, and it can be uh, somewhat challenging to teach, uh, especially to uh, learners who are first uh, language English speakers, uh, because that contrast is not so commonly marked in English as it is in Lakota. And if it is, uh, then it will occur on the tense as a tense on the verb. So compare, if you are hungry, eat this. She's trying to verify whether her husband is hungry at this point. In the second situation, she says, if you get hungry, eat this. In here, she's predicting that during his trip, he will get hungry. And in this case, uh, she's packing the food for him so that he can eat it. Now, that distinction is made in Lakota through the choice of the words for if. So this allows the students to observe that with some help in the information box. And the unit continues with additional information and uh, with 
practice activities, obviously. Very often at the end of a group of units, we offer a summary or an overview as in this example, where we provide the uh, overview of the types of conditional clauses, where we list them and their examples and translations and the cross references where they can be found. But notice also that we include the concessive conditional here, even though it was actually not grouped with, uh, with the other conditionals because it does not group with them structurally, but it does group with them functionally. So we add it here in this overview. Uh, another strategy is an input flood, uh, which is a technique which allows exposure to the target item uh, in a far more frequent and, ex and intensive way than it would normally be encountered during reading. So students can observe the numerous sentences with the habitual marker schna, and with the help of these notes, they can also notice the types of words that schna can follow. I am running out of time, so I'll have to skip the discussion of some of these uh, much more syntactically complex structures, such as relative clauses occurring in clefts and so on. Also a strategy of step-by-step -step for complex patterns and rules. But I do want to mention something about sequencing. For example, in traditional textbooks, the possessive pronoun tawa is introduced early on. And this is probably because it is very easy to teach, very easy to use. But when, once students are introduced to this pronoun, they usually over apply it to contexts where Lakota uses different ways of possession marking. Therefore, in this grammar, uh, we introduce tawa only after the units on possessive and dative verbs. Uh, connected to that is the idea of demarcation, which is one of the design criteria for pedagogical grammars, grammar rules, according to Swan. And the point of demarcation is to show the learner that not, not only how the pattern is used, but also where it cannot be used. The possessive pronoun tawa is again a good example of a grammatical feature that benefits from demarcation. So here is um, an image from the last third of the page that introduces tawa. And this section is devoted to the instances where tawa cannot be used in Lakota, but um, these all of these instances are based on transfer from English, so they emanate from the structural differences between English and Lakota and from the common learner el errors that we have, uh, we have collected over the years. Uh, so the impact in the community based on our observation, uh, observing classes and receiving feedback from the community of teachers and students, it is safe to say that the grammar has had the following types of positive impact. It resulted in more confidence among teachers and self-motivated adult learners. Uh, it has increasingly been used by, used by teachers for preparation of classroom activities. And more and more students use it for reference when reading texts, for example, when they encounter uh, an unknown functional word or an un previously unknown uh, construction, syntactic construction, they consult the, the book. Uh, the book also provides an important sense of pride, which can be illustrated with the following statements from native speaking Lakota language teachers, and I won't have the time to read them, but I, you can pause the video and read them. Here I show a photograph of a copy of the grammar handbook used by one of the Lakota language teachers, and please observe that she has filled out all of the activities. Uh, she's also highlighted many things in the instructions, in the example sentences and practice uh, sentences as well. She's placed uh, numerous bookmarks in the book, but also has been taking extensive notes. She reported having used the book extensively in preparation for her classes, but also learning from it by reading it from cover to cover and also coming back to it and especially to uh, the uh, exercises. There are very many other aspects of the of this grammar and this project that are, I could talk about at length, but unfortunately, the time is limited. So uh, with that, I would like to end by expressing my gratitude to the Lakota people. For the past 30 years, I have been privileged to be invited by the Lakota people to work on numerous uh, collaborative projects. 
and partnerships. And so I would like to say thank you to the many uh, dear friends, colleagues, and students in Lakota country. Here are my references. And with that, I say thank you.